we are starting a new series. And if you saw, if you actually can press the link when I send that out or see it on social media, it was this little picture of Advent. And it says, a season of expectation. And I don't know if you're familiar with this term. It it is a little bit more of a liturgical type of thing of Advent services, but I really like the concept. And as I I started researching a little bit more, I realized I kind of do this anyway uh, as a pastor. And and you've heard me say this many, many times before. And if you're new, then you're hearing it for the first time. But I love Christmas, okay? I love the approach to Christmas. I like the day after Thanksgiving because then I'm allowed to be an elf, okay? Um, Claire is fed up with me already because I've already pulled out everything. Our house is decorated inside. I didn't get to outside yet. Um, but I, it's not just that. There's so many pieces to it. And again, I don't know if you felt, felt, ever felt like this, even for vacation sometimes. It's that approach that's sometimes fun. And then when you get there, it's over and you're like, ah. Oh. But it was that anticipation, the expecting that is sometimes more fun than anything else. And so I end up talking about this a lot each Christmas season. And it's the same picture of what Advent means. Um, A lot of churches do it a lot of different ways. And so I want to talk about this a little bit and explain the meaning behind it. And again, this isn't necessarily a biblical meaning. This is just what Advent means for the church history in the sense of this. It's a season of reflective preparation for the nativity of Christ at Christmas and the expected return of Christ in the second coming. And so this was many, many, many years ago that this idea came up and it was a way for the church to prepare. A certain amount of Sundays before Christmas is to get ready and prepare. How many people have already started to prepare for Christmas in some way, shape, or form? Some of you are doing this in August and you have something wrong with you, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I don't. I love Christmas, and you, you all understand this. I do not listen to Christmas music until the day after Thanksgiving. That is law in my home because I like it so much. I, di- I get a little disappointed when it's August and I go into Costco and BJ's and there's already Christmas stuff in the aisle. Like, hold on, wait a minute, all right? So I want you to look at this in a bigger picture. So, like I said, I've always liked this idea. I think it's important. Um, we all have traditions that we will do or attempt to do each and every year. And I feel as a church, it's always important to kind of stop and slow down a little bit because this is what happens for most of us, right? The day right after Thanksgiving, we kind of get over that time and then the gas pedal goes. Everything starts to speed up. You start to look at the calendar and I'm going to make you overwhelmed already. And you start realizing how many Sundays left, how many weekends left. How do I get to Tanger? How am I going to do this? You know, when is Amazon sale over? Well, come on, right? And we're like, how, who have I gotten the gifts for? Who haven't I? And it's like, oh, oh, oh. All right. And I think it's so important. Because in this moment of all of the fun stuff of Christmas, we can lose what the meaning of the season is really about. And I like it. I like all of it, and I think sometimes it's important. I actually remember as a kid, once the, uh, and probably not like a real little kid, like a little bit older to, to, to appreciate everything. You know, the house was decorated and different things. And how many people grew up with an artificial tree? Okay. Two of you. All right. The rest of you never did. All right. I'll just share my story anyway, because it's a painful story because they were not the way they are now that you would just open up and there's three little sections and they just unfold. It was color coded wire tipped into the and you had to find anyone remember this. OK. All right. Now the hands are going up. And what happened over the years, the colors on the end would start to fade. All right. And, and after a while, is this blue or is it green? Like, and I think my father probably bought, stole either my mother's nail polish or, or something and tried to you know, paint it on there. And so doing the Christmas tree was, was a painstaking chore because it took hours sometimes. Pull this box out, f- figure out which pieces go in. But at this moment, like I said, I remember sitting, finally everything's done, sitting in a recliner, Christmas music is on, and, and, and kind of like falling asleep just like in the midst of it all and just like, ah. Oh just relaxing. And years later, actually, I remember being away. It was actually the year I graduated from college. And if you've ever been to Disney World during Christmas, it's a very cool time. They actually can make it snow down Main Street. Uh, But I remember being at one of the hotels. And at one point, 
uh, just kind of getting away from the crowd and, and going to a, a, t- a tall level of all of these like lounge areas in this one hotel and listening. And there was instrumental Christmas music. Like a, this was like a new thing to me. I know it sounds weird, but I was like, oh, and just kind of sitting there. I remember just really praying and reflecting and probably then falling asleep wherever I was. <laughs> Now, that's not the tradition I want you to remember is falling asleep. But being that, I, that idea of, of really reflecting, really taking time to slow down and, and think and pray. And anybody have an Advent calendar? Okay. And I don't mean the cheesy ones that just have a bunch of chocolates in them, which are really usually disappointing, right? You're like, what? This is, this is what I was looking forward to every day. If you have a real Advent calendar, here's a picture of ours. Uh, that's not the actual one. We have this one home. And uh, it's become a labor of love for me, okay? This was my thing, all right? Claire kind of stayed out of this. Uh, So if you can see, there's little boxes. It's not more than, you know, maybe two feet by two feet. So every box is very small. And so for years, uh, you know, I have two children. And so I had to figure out how to fit two things inside of every single one of those boxes. And they vary in sizes, okay? And year, the pressure was on sometimes because it was like, what's dad going to do this year? How is he going to top last year? And it was impossible sometimes. I was like finding stuff and ordering stuff. And, and I still do it to this day. Noah's not as interested anymore, thankfully, because, you know, he just would want money in there. And that's about it. Connie, I think I get one more year in, which, you know, eventually, hopefully there'll be grandkids and then dad can do it. Granddad can do it again. I don't want to be called granddad. I don't know why that came out. Grandpa. All right, that probably a ways away, but I will save all of those things I f- tried to fit because it's they're tiny, some of them. And so, but each and every morning, the kids would wake up and they'd be excited and open it up. And and many years we had scripture verse in there too, which was like trying to get them like read the scripture verse before they play with the toy. And they were like, Nah, I just want the toy. And so, but the same idea, right? We may, I don't know if you ever thought about it, that's what Advent calendar is about. It's a, it's that it's that expectation every day of here's how are we preparing? How are we reflecting? What are we really expecting? And some of us are just expecting a lot of stress and headaches and you can't wait for it to be over. And I I feel sorry for you because then you miss what really this season's about because it's going to be busy. But expectation and contemplation is so important. Each week what we're going to do here on Sunday is we're going to walk through a certain word and we're going to unpack that a little bit I want to give you an opportunity to reflect, an opportunity to let that expectation build and be reminded of what the Christmas season's about. And of course, I'll end with a song that I really want you to sit and listen to and then have that time like I used to, all right, not to fall asleep, but just really sit because it'll be hard. Trust me, even today, you're probably like, okay, we got things we already got to start working on and, and I want you to intentionally slow down. Because there's a promise and a reminder of this expectation all throughout Scripture. Here is an Isaiah 7.14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Again, we read this through New Testament eyes. So we're like, that's so cool. But do you realize when they read this, they were like, for years opening that Advent calendar and nothing. (laughs) <laughs> nothing's there. And they're like, ah, oh, I thought it was going to be this year. And so this is a prophecy that will eventually get fulfilled, but there was a long time waiting in between. How many people like to wait? All right. Thankfully, you're paying attention or you weren't. Okay. Eric likes to wait. All right. Most of us, we like to wait up to a certain point and then we lose patience, right? And some of you have walked off of a line because you're like, this line is too long. It's not worth it. This is the season, right, that that happens. You, you walk by that store and you're like, no way. I'm not even going to go in there. Thank you for online shopping, okay? But there's this expectation that, that needs to be built. There's this waiting. Isaiah talks about it again in chapter 9. For us, for, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We Last year, if you remember, we unpacked those words every single week, the importance behind them. I love this quote about the Advent uh, season from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, no less. It says, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, 
who know themselves to be poor and imperfect and who look forward to something greater to come. And I want us to realize that, like, that's the excitement each year. We get that reminder that Jesus, that God himself, came down to earth and would eventually make that approach to the cross and make that opportunity for our sins to be forgiven. And so, what, like I said, some churches do what they call an advent calendar. And so each, le- each week, I will light a digital <laughs> candle. And the first one is this one of hope. I want us to think about that word. I'm going to give you a couple of verses. And again, I'm really going to focus on this reflective time today and and the response time. I think that's really, really important. So we're going to journey through this and be reminded of hope. We'll jump right into the Psalms. Psalm 43, 5 says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Psalm 62 says this, Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Notice each verse, the psalmist is talking to himself. (laughs) Talking to his own soul, right? If you were here for Wednesday or last Sunday, we sang that song, Gratitude. And that the bridge of that song says, Come on, my soul. Have you ever had to talk to your soul? Come on, you ha- you, there's those moments. You're like, no, I, I, come on, I, I got I to gotta get into gear here. I got to get into focus. I know this is true. And this is, this is so important for us. The psalmist is reminding himself in deep down in his soul, not just tricking his brain, but getting into his soul and saying, you know that this is true. And I'm going to declare it over my own self. Like this is what I need to know. Well, let's define this word hope. I know, big shocker, I'm going to define a word. But this is important. It's almost uh, very, very close in the Old Testament and New Testament. And it says this, hope means to wait expectantly. But look at these other words, be pained, to stay, to tarry, to trust. So there's a process, right? Hope can sometimes even drain us where it's like, wow, to pain us. Because like I'm putting my hope in God. That means there's some, there's some effort sometimes on our part to be like, you know what? This takes a little bit of work. This takes a little bit of, uh, of effort and time. And this is what Christmas is all about as a kid, right? We've all made our list at certain points, right? And I hope that I get fill in the blank, all right? And some of you know that joy of opening it and saying, yes. And then other people are like, oh, man, <laughs> I really hope. And it doesn't change as we're an adult. Come on, come on. You're lying because you all have the list that, uh, of the things that you know you probably need. And then there's things that you want. All right. Me and Anthony, we'll, we'll talk about that later. And we'll, we'll things that our wives will be shocked if we, they ever buy them for us. OK, uh, we all have our wish lists. But my wife overdid it this year, yes, for, for my birthday. So I'm good for like a decade, I think, right now. So, um, But realize that, that there, there's this idea, right, that, 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 that hope. And what happens, again, even with the Christmas season is, like I said, it's sometimes a little bit of a letdown. I don't mean because of the presents, of because we get this exciting and we expect certain things to happen and then they don't. Because sometimes it also ends, the same thing, like I said, with a vacation or something else. It ends, and then we're like, all right, what am I hoping for next? But this hope, we're going to see in Scripture, doesn't disappoint us. Amen? It's actually everlasting. It starts right away once we respond to the message of Jesus and who he is, and it doesn't end even throughout eternity. Woo! That's an exciting hope. That's something you open up, and it lasts forever. How many people would want that? You never need new batteries. You never need an upgraded model. You never need to do anything to it. It it, it takes care of itself, right? That's awesome. And sometimes we forget that even as this season approaches. Look at Romans chapter 5. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. We don't like that process. (laughs) <laughs> that takes too long. There, there, there's some suffering in there. There's some different things. But look what it says, verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out 
into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The NLT says it like this. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. This is so important that we realize this, that this hope will never let us down. This this phrase, not disappoint, this is what it means. And it's so great. I love this. Not to not disappoint. So to disappoint means to disgrace, bring to shame, put to utter confusion, and frustrate. Okay? How many people have been disappointed? All right? And that, all of that sometimes like, oh man, that's times a thousand. Because we're disappointed and we feel that. But this says, it will not, this will not disappoint this hope. Do you believe that? Hope in Jesus will not disgrace us, will not bring us to shame, will not put us into utter confusion, and will not frustrate us. Wow! Sometimes I forget that. Sometimes I realize when I put my hope in Jesus, because people will disappoint us. Situations will disappoint us. Everything on this earth will disappoint us in one way, shape, or form. It's just bound to happen. It's, they're not constructed or made to give us the hope that we can have. But sometimes we put that hope in there, right? We put our eggs in that basket like, oh, if this comes through, this will change everything. And then it doesn't. And then we're like, oh, I'm so disgraced, I'm, I'm in utter confusion, and I'm frustrated. I've been there. And sometimes it's because I wasn't putting my hope in Jesus. I wasn't putting my hope in the only thing that will not do these things. Look at Romans 8. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Stop right there. Think about that. How many people in this room have a car? Okay. You might hope you have a new car one day, but you don't wake up every day saying, God, I really need a car because you have one. Some of you, we don't even think about it. I actually thought about this today. I don't every day. I just happened to. I started my car. I said, thank you, God, that my car started. (laughs) Right? How many people take that for granted? My hand goes up first. We just take that for granted. Oh, it worked. But when it doesn't work, what do we all... God, I really need you to come through. I just found out the bill for this to get fixed is this, or now I need to get a new car. And what do we start to put? Well, I'm putting my hope. I need this. I need this. So this verse is really powerful and deep. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Well, about that patient part, right? We're not good at that, but that's what we're supposed to do. We need to grow in this. I know I need to grow in this. And again, this isn't just, God, give me something that I want. It's that hope of eternity. It's like, okay, this is temporary. I can get through this because there's a hope in someone and somewhere that's greater than this situation. How many people need that reminder? I do. I know. We should have, like, given everybody, like, like, espressos before we started today. I can feel it in the room. It's like... We just want to sit back and relax. But this is so important. Hebrews 10 says it this way. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Have you professed this hope? Because it's one thing to say, "Mm, I think so. But when you say it out loud, there's something scary that happens. Because this is what we start to do in our human minds. What if it doesn't work? Right? What, what, if I, what if I put all my hope in this God that I can't see, and what if it doesn't work? What if he doesn't work? What if he doesn't show up? Come on. I, your pastor has had those thoughts and those feelings. Why? Because I'm human. We all will. But notice it says this, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. So we, we have to say it out loud. And sometimes we kind of say it with grating teeth and like, I hope. But this is the important part. For he who promised is faithful. You know what? It's God's word. We're taking him at his word. He's the one who's going to be faithful. We just have to sometimes sit there and hold on to it. It makes us nervous. But God promised this hope. All we are doing is responding. All we are doing is grabbing on and said, you said you'd be here. I'm holding on to you. But what happens is if we let go too soon, then, then we're letting go. No one can make us hold on. But this hope, I know this because I've seen it in my own life. This hope will carry you 
Amen? Sometimes you feel like, I'm going to let go, and, then, and you know that this hope is literally carrying you. I love that Joni said that she felt those prayers. They went all across the ocean. Isn't that awesome? All right, no Wi-Fi needed, no connective spotty spots that we needed, no hot spots available. Those prayers impacted her on the other side of the globe. Whoa! I, I, I never actually prayed that Joni would feel those prayers. Sorry, Joni, I never prayed that specifically. But she knew. God was answering those prayers. As a, as a church we gathered, or as many family and friends, that's awesome. That's exciting. And I want you to know that, that when you put your hope in God, sometimes he will literally just come and, and carry you. And you're going to be like, I don't even know how I'm doing this. I don't even know how I'm getting up. I don't even know how I have this peace, but I'm putting my hope in God. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I want to define these two words because I think they're powerful and important. Now, faith is confidence. Confidence means support, substance, steadiness, assurance, which that's the next word we're going to define. So they're they're almost synonymous. But think about that, like something of real substance. And that's why it's hard for us sometimes because people are like, oh, you have faith. And you're like, oh, that's nice. It's almost like this, like, you know, twinkly little thing that we're supposed to, like, believe. Oh, faith. No, no, no. According to what the Bible says, that faith is substance. We can have assurance. We can have confidence. We can literally put our life on it. I was about to stand on this, and then I realized I don't actually have too much confidence in this. I'm not sure what kind of wood this is, but it would make me nervous, right? But that, that's a perfect picture. That wasn't in my notes. I didn't say stand on those blocks. I was just going to get wild with a corded microphone in my hand. See, you don't know what's going to happen. But if I were to stand on this, first of all, my wife's already given me eyes, right? You would all be nervous, right? I would be too. Because I, I'm not so sure this is going to hold me. But I'm not nervous standing on here, though maybe I should. Tor, how well is this constructed? <laughs> no, but like, think about that in our own life. Once we know something is sure, we don't get nervous going to it again. We're like, oh, no, that, that's going to that, that's gonna come through. I, I know. Like I said, we don't, once our car has broken down, what are we then? We're nervous every time we start. About, okay, good. Whew. All right, we got it. But God wants to build this confidence in us. In who? In him. Now we go, oh, God, God's going to be involved in this process? Oh, I can trust him with that because he's come through before. That's this next word, assurance. Proof, evidence, conviction. You know, you'll live by your convictions when you really believe something. But why? Because you've experienced it. So the same thing can happen on a negative side. If you've only experienced hurt and pain, that will be your conviction. I don't believe that I can not have that. I remember meeting someone that I worked with many, many years ago, and every single person in his family was divorced, even his grandparents. He actually said, one point, I don't think I know anybody that's actually still married. And he had, like, literally, he had to, like, think. He's like, I don't know anyone. And I was like, that's crazy. So in his mind, marriage doesn't work because every single person that he knows is divorced. Parents, cousins, grandparents. I mean, so, like, that becomes a conviction. You're like, ah, that's what I believe. That's my evidence. That's my proof. That's what I see. And so flip it on the other side. When you've seen God be faithful, when you've seen him show up in the little things, and sometimes we need that reminder that he shows up every single day. Ready? (sighs) That's God. He let us have another breath. Oh, come on, Pastor Keith. That's just, you know, the natural state of everything happening. Yeah, really? Okay. (laughs) You tell me that when someone's gasping for air and they don't have it. Think about that. So this back to this verse, I'm going to read it again. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for, right? It's solid. That hope is real. And assurance about what we do not see. So we're not losing our minds, okay? We've seen it. We've seen the proof. We've seen God show up. We've seen him do it before, and he'll do it again. Our faith will grow as we hope. We put our hope in Jesus more and more. Not, I hope, right? We could say, I hope with question marks. Have you ever done that? I've done it. I hope, I hope the Bills win again. All right, that was scary on Thanksgiving, just by the way, if you watch a football watcher, okay? We say that all right. I hope that I feel better. 
I hope that this comes through. I'm not talking about a hope with a question mark. We say this, but my hope is in Jesus. And Jesus is sure. Jesus is constant. Jesus is faithful. And I can put my hope in him. Amen Amen is right. Because the amening is not me. It's amening what God's word says. So think about it this way. I want you to put this definition into real, like a real prayer this morning. Jesus, I must wait expectantly to the point of pain, to the point of staying, to the point of tarrying, to the point of trusting in you alone. Wow, think about that. How many people can grow in that hope? I can. I need that sometimes. I need that reminder. Like, no, I need to put my full hope in Jesus. This isn't easy, but it's available. And I believe it's sometimes just as simple as asking, God, increase my hope in you. I want real hope in you, that I'm waiting expectantly, knowing it's like Christmas Day. Oh, it's coming. Oh, man, God's going to show up, right? Hello? We, get, we need sometimes someone in our life like that, because I know that's helpful. When someone's around you, like, oh, no, no, God's going to show up. God's going to do something. And again, not making believe, just saying, because I know God's faithful. I don't know his timing and his way, but he'll do it. I know, and we, we did this with our, our, our staff as they started to, to grow. And just so you know, we didn't have a staff <laughs> for a long time. It was me and Claire and Noah and Connie, all right? And if we didn't show up to church, there was no true light, okay? I don't know what was happening. We actually just said that this week. If you notice, our, our worship team was down this morning and for all different reasons, work and sickness and all this stuff. And I said, what had happened when, 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 when one of us was sick? Like, did we just not have church? Like, and, and Claire said, no, you know, we just, we just did it, like, I, some way or the other. And there's actually even a funny story that one week, I don't know why, where Noah was, but some people have this memory in the old building. I won't ever do it again, I promise. But I led worship with the bass drum in front of me, and I played the bass drum while I strummed the guitar. Oh, Aaron remembers that. What was I thinking? I don't know. Maybe I watched Mary Poppins the night before, and I wanted to be like Bert. But the point was, you, you, you just do whatever you have to do sometimes. And so uh, there's this idea, right, that I must, th- where, where was I going with that? Uh, that there's this hope, right? We have hope in Christ, that he will do things. Oh, I know where I was going with it. That we told our staff, especially Joe and Gabby, when they said, you know, we feel called, we want to come out here, we want to help you. And we said, we want you to live on the North Fork. And Alex and Julie had already made that transition. We, believe, we said, we believe that's really, really important. We want you to live out here. And at first they were like, well, you know, we'll see. We'll stay with our family in Shirley. That's not that far. And I said, no. <laughs> Pastor Keith said no. And here's why I said no. I said, it's really, really important. I said, God's going to provide if he wants you out here. And you know that within just a few weeks, out of a crazy set of events um, that I couldn't have ever picked, God provided them a home in Mattituck. And they will tell you now, it's so, it's so important that they live out here. And why did I say that? It's not just because I just, you know, I'm going to be super faith-filled pastor. It's because I've seen that in my own life. God provided every single way along my life and Claire's life for a home, for this church, for things to happen within our health and our life. And so the more that you see God show up, what do you do? It builds your confidence. In who? In him. And it's not a cocky thing to say God's going to show up. I'm not saying God will do X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to put him in a box. I'm just going to say, trust in God. He's going to show up. He's going to provide. Amen? And we need that hope. So are you ready? This is what you can do this morning. You can ask, you can wait, and you can receive. I believe that. I don't know how it's going to happen. Trust me, if it was just like, you know, like you, some of us, you cooked your turkey, and they still have those popper things? I don't know. And they pop, and they tell you the turkey's done? All right? We didn't have one on ours, so I, it was a little different. But, right, you, if it was just that easy, like, oh, I got hope. Here we go. I'm done. I can leave, you know? It's a process. But I believe that sometimes we need to just stop and slow down. So I want you to reflect. I want you to ponder, and I want you to expect. And I'm going to close with this verse. And then I'm going to play a song. And then I'm going to actually play a video first. And then I'm going to play a song. And this is what I want to end with. Romans 15. This is a charge that Paul would have written to the church in Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Those are two other words we're going to cover over the next couple of weeks. Big shocker, I know. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
You know what the awesome thing is? Is when we ask and wait and receive, it's nothing that we're doing. We're literally being filled up with the hope that he provides. That as it says, that you may overflow with hope. And you know what's exciting? Our hope is going to overflow. And what happens when things overflow? All right? They, they, they spread. All right? And it's usually, right, we think of a bad way right away, right? The toilet overflowed. Thank you, Pastor Keith. That's the picture that you want us to think about when we're praying. No, I want you to think that you are a living vessel, and when you fill up with hope, that hope is going to overflow to somebody else. And somebody's going to hear hope in your tonage of how you say something. They're going to hear you talk about God in a way that they're like, what? And trust me, it's easy. I already sat in a doctor's office the other day, and we were waiting, and, it was, and, the, and, the, and the doctor was late, and people were getting a little disgruntled. And right away, I, I, I wanted to feed into it because, you know, I'm sitting there too. And I, and I, I tried my best to intentionally start to, like, like say things and just kind of bring up hope because people are sharing, which is very odd to me in a doctor's office. Sometimes people just start sharing whatever. Jenny knows, right? People just start talking, and we're in the waiting room. And I knew there was that moment because someone started to share. And, I, and I, I, I tried to help shift their thinking, you know, and started to, and, and again, trust me, I didn't get up and say, all right, I'm the pastor. Let's have a service. All right. A turn to your Bible. Like I just started to say stuff. And it was funny how it did start to change the conversation a little bit because I could have fed into it. Trust me. I could have been like, oh, and, and usually people like to share their woes. I don't know why that is, but we do. And we want other people to hear that and say, oh, isn't that terrible? Yeah, it's terrible, but this. And I actually brought up the Lord in kind of a roundabout way. And I said, oh, well, you know, God can do miracles. And then, then the person actually changed their tune. And they're like, you know what? That's true. And I, and I just found a connective way. And I did. I, sometimes you have to ask God, God, help, help me in this moment. How do I say this? How do I help do this? And so I love this verse. I'm going to say it again. May the God of hope... He's the one who supplies the hope. Fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, right? Trust, that's not an easy word, but it can, it's possible. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there you go. Someone's getting a call right now, and you need to fill them with hope right now. So I want to just, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a general closing of prayer. I'm going to play a video that's directly connected to this word hope. Please read it and pay attention because it's not one of those videos where they're going to speak. So you've got to already be in reflective and pondering and expecting mode. And then this song's just going to come on right afterwards. After the song's over, there's just going to be instrumental music. And I really want to encourage you this morning. If you need a refill of hope, all right, I'm going to stay up here. I'm going to ask Claire to come up here. We just want to pray with you. We just want to stand with you and help in that process. But if you need to just sit and ponder and, and listen to the Lord this morning, then you do that. So you leave whenever you need to leave. So like I said, I'm going to pray right now as we get into this time. And then I'm going to just pray that you really respond to the Lord this morning. And um, I'm going to do that too until the song's over. So I, if I fall asleep, wake me up. Just kidding. Um, but don't fall asleep. If you are falling asleep, I really encourage you, stand up, walk around, come up here, kneel at the altar, whatever it may be, whatever you need to do this morning to just stop and say, God, I need your hope this morning. I need to wait expectantly for you. Lord, we thank you for this moment this morning. We pray in this season of Advent, God, that we would take it serious and we'd really let you speak to our heart. We're thankful, God, for the hope that is available in you and you alone. And so I pray, God, that you would fill each and every heart, as your word says, to overflowing with that hope that is available. In Jesus' name, amen.